Noodles the hell so you pray to him. <laughs> Kickle Street. <laughs> Kickle Street, you know Newton? I was um, a few do uh, doors from our house, which was uh, number four home street in Grey Lynn. And one of the co founders of the Panthers, who was an ex, an ex gang member, um, lived at uh, Kickle Street. And, and um, his parents uh, were away, and so he said, That's it's at this meeting. <laughs> and then when, you know, if they came back earlier and we just oh, skedaddled jumped out the windows out of there. It would have been a quite exciting time in terms of women's liberation issues. Could you talk a little bit more about the how women's liberation and feminism mm -hmm. have impacted? Um, yeah, great question. Um, when we had to read Seize the Time by Bobby Seale, it talked about the black sisters. There's a chapter there that's about the black sisters. And when I read it, I said, oh, that's not what Samoan <laughs> women are like. Our, our Samoan matriarchs rule the family like the men. I mean, my dad gave his pay packet to mum every, every pay, payday. She was uh, the head of the household. You know, everyone here who's got a, a Samoan matriarch knows what I mean. And so I just totally, and that's what really um, pointed out to me the difference. That's why we called ourselves the Polynesian Panthers, because um, they came from a different socio-historical context to us. So um, I've never considered myself a feminist. Um, because I love men too much, <laughs> especially my dad. <laughs> and so, you know, it was like more, um, and I'm, I'm studying this now and I've published on it. I, it's a thing that's called womanism. I, I, I like the womanism kind of thing, which is I started with the black women in America. Um, but because that talks about uh, com complementary relationships with um, the, the males, not in them and us. And it also has the notion of spirituality uh, in part of the womanism. And that's what I think is uh, a specific trait as well. So I've published on that. If people want to know, I'll give you the reference. One of the important uh, cultural references that we have is this thing called the Anganga. And the, the strongest relationship within the Samoan culture is between the brother and the sister. Uh, and it's just a, it's a sacred relationship and an ancient one uh, where the brother is pretty much the servant to his sister. Um, and so there is already that uh, disposition, so to, so to speak, uh, of, of the male attitude to women. This is, of course, pre-missionary times, and then when the missionaries came, they, the, the, the nature of the Penanga changed. Uh, and so now that's been pretty much decimated uh, and, and put in another context than, from, than the original context. So the veneration and the respect for the sister has now been taken by these strangers and imposed and placed in the Christian context where now that the Anganga is given to the Christian God and to the Christian servants of God to the point now where uh, ministers of religion are referred to as a Anganga bull, the new Anganga. But there are still, thankfully, practitioners of Anganga still out there and that's being rediscovered and re indigenized and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And it operated in the Panthers, like, you know, we knew the boys would have our backs if we were in danger or protesting. And we always had the boys back when they got really angry and wanted to, you know, fight. We'd say, well, how about a petition? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so we had all the, everything covered, you know, our group. And there was tremendous respect for each other and that's why we got things done. And, um, yes, yeah, so, but the sisters were the backbone of the Polynesian Panthers, don't get me wrong. They were th then and now, even today, you've got um, the sister Pauline and her box. You've got my box and we kind of coordinate our Educate to Liberate program in the school. So nothing much has changed over 50 years.
Um, really good to see you, Milani, Red again. Um, just really want to, Rev, if you could just share with us that special relationship we have with the Tangata Whenua. Thank you. Okay, well, um, well, my name is, well, as you know, Alec Toreo Pua, but my uh, grandmother is uh, Mutuai Tamasese, who is the older sibling of uh, Tamasese Meropiwa Anna the third who was shot and later died of his wounds um, by the New Zealand Armed Constabulary. An apology has been given already for that. So it seems to run in the family. <laughs> for apologies. Anyway, the, the story goes that uh, this is a story that circulated in my family ever since. Uh, and he, from Sister the Lord of the Third, uh, he was the head of the Mao, which was a peaceful resistance movement in Samoa against the New Zealand administration and the imposition of its uh, rather oppressive laws, uh, etc. Colonial Samoa. Uh, and he was uh, exiled to New Zealand and imprisoned in Mount Eden jail. I guess the, the equivalent here would be Mount Crawford, one of the oldest jails here. And it was an old, already an old jail in, 19, in the 1920s when he was exiled here. The offence for which he was uh, imprisoned was his failure to move a hedge on his own land to comply with the governor's or the New Zealand administration's uh, uh, program of reorganising the villages so that they were more along the lines of, a, of an English village. So he refused to move his hedge, his hedgerow on his own land. And that was just what the, what the admin needed to have him removed and arrested. So he ended up in Mount Eden prison. He was there for two years. But while he was there, he was visited by a Maui Pōwari. And they began a relationship with still and, and they made arrangements that still we honour today in our own family. Uh, if you can imagine, Thomas says that he would have been one of the first Samoans uh, here to New Zealand, and certainly one of the first Samoan political prisoners to be in a New Zealand jail. But he was treated as a criminal. So Maui Pōmari, who was from a high-born family himself, he, un he understood this, so he went to see Tamasese while he was in Mount Eden and he took books and food and clothing to him. Uh, and Tamasese was pretty much taken out of, his, out of the things that he was familiar with, away from the food, away from his people. He was also stripped of his titles and there are four royal titles and four royal titles in Samoa, he, is, he, is one of, he holds one of them. Uh, so Maui Pumari understood that and he went to pay homage to him and that's formed this relationship now uh, that is very strong in my family and whenever the current uh, holder of that title comes to New comes to Aotearoa, uh, he goes to Hawaii uh, Waititi Marae, which is in West Auckland, and that is pretty much the, the, um, the, the, the place that is home for us is there. Um, a lot of people think that uh, the Polynesian Panthers, um, their, our deference to the Tangata Whenua began with Ngata Matoa, but, and, and while that did happen, it, it's much older than that much, much older than that, uh, much more significant than that. Um, so what Tamsisi said to Kormari was uh, that he and his kin owe Ma Maui Kormari and his people a great debt. And that from this time, our kin, his kin, me, are going to remember the kindness that was given and anyone who is Samoan um, will know then how, how significant hospitality is in our culture. So he was extended 
this great aroha and hospitality in his time of greatest need. And he never <coughs> got that, neither have we. And it, it's not by accident that there's um, four, five Thomas C. members in the Polynesian Panthers. I mean, you know, we didn't kind of think, oh, let's, you know, let's join the Panthers because we're Thomas C. No, <laughs> the, the fight was in them already. The activist kind of, um, yeah, tendency to, to do what's right. Kilda, thank you for your generosity and sharing your history and your stories with us today. Um, I have a question for Alec. I understand the significance of the Christian church within the Polynesian community. And I'm just um, wondering that how you situate yourself as a revolutionary within the Christian church. Well, um, there is racism even within the Christian church, despite how much stained glass you want to put around it and how many rebels it's still racism. Uh, and all of us have, um, we're in the uh, spheres of activity that we have gone into, we have taken our anti-racism uh, doctrine with us, including into the church. One of the things that I'm very, very interested in now is decolonizing the Christian church in Samoa, mm -hmm. and, and then by extension through the Pacific. And, uh, I was giving a talk on um, on that very subject uh, and looking at uh, recovering our own Pacific spirituality. And I, the, I, one of the critics was saying, "Isn't there isn't there just one one God?" And my response was, "Well, you know, if, if you can't hear the voice of your God." through our own cultural references, then you're probably not listening. <laughs> or else God's not speaking to you. <laughs> One of those two. So I, I can't see that there's any any uh, harm or any kind of separation of the two, but I would like for our people to understand that before contact with the missionaries, we had our own spirituality. We had our own deity, our th own theism, our own understanding of things. And it's not religion, it's spirituality. And this is what I would, this is what I would like to encourage. Um, and one day, from the pulpit, there might be this invocation to Tanga Loa and to the God of the Bible and to the God of the Pacific. That's the invocation I would like to hear. From the pulpit. Um, you've mentioned the homework group and uh, educate to liberate, and um, I'd love if you'd be able to expand on that. The homework centres was to provide our young Pacific kids a place where they could do their homework, and so the, a lot of us were university students, so we wanted to help them with their homework at a set time. But one of the lovely stories we heard just the other day when we were giving a Panthers rap at St. Cuthbert's um, in Auckland, the principal came down and said, oh, that she was one of the homework teachers back in the day when she was at university. So I can imagine, you know, the activist kind of um, education coming out of St. Cuthbert's. <laughs> um, so uh, those sorts of things. And uh, the educate to liberate, that, our parents came to this country for a better education. It's since been subsumed by sports and creative things, but it's always been education because um, you know knowledge is power. Even you know indigenous peoples know that as around the world. So um, education to me is the kind of um, the cover all for everything else. If you get the education right, there will be peace and harmony. Uh, it's not a us or them, it's not polarizing, it's just knowledge. The sharing of knowledge and being open um, to different world views, to be, to be open to different understandings of things. So together you learn new things. Um, and, and so educate to liberate. Um, I've done that in my work as an academic. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's amazing that the students that have, I've had there have gone on to become teachers and have now introduced Pacific Studies into the curriculum in these schools. Um, and, and, you know, that's amazing because that's, as Panthers, 
That's where the revolution lies. That's the revolution, is, is changing the mindset of everyone that hears our story, that hears our histories, of our, rea of our realities. And so I'm just sitting back, I mean, the apology is the apology, but I, don't know, I know that out there, our young, our youth are, are demanding. We're getting, we're getting stories from, uh, questions from young kids saying, oh, I want to be an activist. How can I be an activist? <laughs> And the brothers will usually say, oh, well, you have to tidy up your room when your mum says that. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, because it teaches you discipline and respect. It's all those things. So, you know, that's the kind of thing. Is us, and we tell them, if you look at our platform, annihilate all forms of racism, celebrate your ethnic identity, whatever it is, and educate to liberate, then you are campus. And, and so it's not just an education about you know um, a subject. It's, it's your life. It's, it's educating your whole approach to life and people and relationships. Because in the Samoan um, culture, va the va is crucial. The va is the social and sacred spaces of relationships. You know you can't have one by itself. They both interact to make optimal outcomes things work you get things done when you look after the bar the relationship and the relation the bar between those above beside and below you and that's why someone's are so schizophrenic <laughs> they're gonna have to know what all these bars are but we're taught from a very young age about these different bar and it's in what i call you know the um instructional ad hoc framework. It's do this, do this, don't do that, without any explanation. <laughs> <laughs> and we learn. So that's how we learn. We learn how to behave properly in all those bars. It's amazing, but that's that's our more for you. You've given us a tremendous reminder of the importance of civil disobedience mm -hmm. in, in New Zealand and in our society. But I wonder, given that if, if there's one really critical thing about discrimination is it's the worst thing is where we don't want to know, we don't want to look. And I wonder, as a consequence of, of the value of civil disobedience, what has it been complemented by in how our systems operate that shed light on the things that, that you've expressed that are so dear and important to New Zealand? And, 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 and Okay, one of the one of the first the first uh, activist things I suppose you would say uh, in our community, and we're only 16, 17 year olds, was installing um, uh, traffic lights in pedestrian crossings in a very dangerous intersection in Ponsonby, and that's because a lot of our people were being injured, and there was no safe way to cross the or safer way to cross the road. So what we did was we just formed this continuous line and just marched around there, um, this intersection, so that no cars could come through. And that was just continuous. We weren't breaking the law, but it was being doing, it was being annoying. <laughs> and traffic started to build up on either side of the intersection, and they were being annoyed as well at what we were doing. But we were very clear on what we wanted. We wanted traffic lights here. So three weeks after that, city council put traffic lights there. Yeah. So that's the influence of civil disobedience on law and law change, how it happens. You can do that. Um, and it's, I think it's in my blood, really. Uh, the Mao and Samoa, they did a lot of civil disobedience as well and gained their independence as a result. Um, so. These are the ways that uh, we, we, the relationship between the civil disobedience and the sorts, sorts of things that can happen as a result. And it does remind the people of their own power. You have power, and let's just use that. And we use it at times when um, there is some danger to us or to our society or to the well being of our society. So there's all these different dynamics that are spring from civil disobedience and actually give rise to civil disobedience as well. Uh, just down there in the foyer of this building, 
I see photos of the 1980s Springbok tour. That's the ultimate in, in this country anyway, civil disobedience. And uh, the amazing global effects of that action. Amazing.